Hi, my name is Egbert Swartz, and my talk is about weeds and microbes. And particularly, I'm going to talk about uh, a noxious weed, which is prevalent here in Arizona and the Western United States. And you see a drawing of that weed called cheatgrass right here on the left. Cheatgrass is also known as Bromus tectorum. Um, and I'm going to uh, talk about some of our research in which we are trying to figure out if there are bacteria that live inside the root cells of cheatgrass or on the roots of cheatgrass uh, that are not present on native plants that are growing in the sagebrush ecosystem. This is an outline of my talk. Uh, I first, I'm going to talk about cheatgrass as a noxious weed in the American West. Cheatgrass has invaded the sagebrush ecosystem um, and it has changed uh, how often fires happen in the sagebrush ecosystem. Uh, and that has a very negative effect on the abundance of sagebrush. Uh, there are many endangered species such as the sagebrush grouse uh, that are dependent on sagebrush. They eat sagebrush and so they are negatively impacted by the invasion of cheatgrass. Then I will talk about how it is possible to control cheatgrass invasions um, and then go on to ask the question, how does cheatgrass manage to be so successful? How can cheatgrass establish these monocultures in sagebrush ecosystems. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how microorganisms such as fungi and bacteria help plants to grow. Uh, and then I will talk about our research in which we're trying to identify bacterial populations that are present on cheatgrass roots but are, that are not growing on sagebrush roots. And we think that these bacterial populations might help cheatgrass to invade the sagebrush ecosystem. Um, cheatgrass is a non-native invasive plant and it's also a noxious weed. A non-native plant simply means that it has appeared here through human influence. Cheatgrass uh, was not originally present in the Americas, it comes from Eurasia and Africa, and it was brought over by humans. Uh, not all non-native plants are weeds or noxious weeds necessarily. Invasive plants tend to be very aggressive and take over natural habitats, such as a sagebrush ecosystem. Um, both native and non-native plants can be considered noxious. And noxious is a term that is defined by the government. Uh, it occurs when there is a very negative impact on agriculture uh, or wildlife or public health, for instance. Uh, cheatgrass has a, a particularly negative impact on wildlife, as we'll see in a little bit. Um, here are some images of cheatgrass. You see a seedling, a cheatgrass seedling here on the right. Uh, cheatgrass, cheatgrass seedlings appear in the spring, uh, but also there can be a second germination event in the fall after the monsoon rains. And then rapidly they will establish a monoculture, which is shown here on the bottom left. And you can see the seed heads that have formed. And then after a little while, the cheatgrass will dry out and will be very susceptible to fire. Uh, as mentioned previously, cheatgrass is a native parts of Africa, Asia, and Europe. And it began arriving in the New World as early as the 18th century. So it's been here for a long time. This is a distribution map that shows where cheatgrass is prevalent in the United States. Uh, and what you can see is that in the Western United States, where there are lots of light green and dark green areas, cheatgrass is abundant. So dark green means that there's a high density of cheatgrass present in the counties, whereas light green means there are relatively few cheatgrass plants present. Uh, the unit here is number of individuals per square meter. And you can see that Coconino County right here is dark green, meaning that we have a large amount of cheatgrass here in the county. Other hotspots are in northern Nevada, uh, southern Oregon, Idaho has a large amount of cheatgrass as well, and so do parts of Utah and parts of western Colorado. The cheatgrass invasion is dynamic, as you can see in this image. Uh, what you are seeing here is a series of maps uh, that go from uh, 2001 all the way to 2000 and 17. Um, and in dark red are the areas where there is a large 
uh, percent cover of cheatgrass. Uh, so when you see dark red areas, it means that there's lots of cheatgrass there. So here's northern Nevada, and you can see these hot spots of cheatgrass, as well as in Idaho. And then Utah also has some dark red spots where there is lots of cheatgrass. Um, there is cheatgrass in western Colorado as well, uh, but we don't see these dark red spots where maybe as much as 70% of the land is covered in cheatgrass. Cheatgrass invades many native habitats. And one of the biggest native habitat is the sagebrush ecosystem, of which you see an image right here. So in green are sagebrush plants, mature sagebrush plants. And then below that, you see a monoculture of cheatgrass. The cheatgrass has senesced, it's very dry, and it's very susceptible to fire at this point. And that cheatgrass, because it is so dry, can easily burn. And so these fires will start in the sagebrush ecosystem. And the sagebrush is not adapted to this change in fire regime and does not survive these fires. As a result, the sagebrush dies off. Uh, and in the next season, the cheatgrass, which is an annual grass, will, will reestablish itself. And eventually it will form monocultures in the sagebrush ecosystem without any sagebrush being present. The sagebrush is an important food source for several uh, important wildlife, uh, some of whom are endangered. So here's the greater sage grouse shown here on the left, uh, which is near threatened. Its population is declining. And on the right is shown the Gunnison sage grouse, which is endangered. Its population is also declining. Uh, these birds feed off of sagebrush, and with a decline in the sagebrush ecosystem, these birds are uh, less likely to thrive and they are endangered. This is a map that shows where the Gunnison sage grouse habitat is. So in dark or in purple, you can see the area where the Gunnison sage grouse lives. Here is the Four Corners area. And you can see that parts of Colorado, close to the Four Corners areas, are critical sage grouse habitat. Um, there are many habitat protection campaigns underway to try to conserve the habitat of the Gunnison sage grouse. Um, you can see in uh, dark red are proposed areas of critical environmental concern. Um, so we would like to protect these areas, especially. Um, in, in pink are critical habitat for the Gunnison sage grouse. Um, and, and so we would like to very much prevent cheatgrass invasions in these areas so that the sagebrush ecosystem can thrive and keep supporting these endangered populations of grouse. In light blue, you can see contested oil and gas leases. And so there's a conflict between the oil or the fossil fuel recovery and protection of the sage grouse birds. How can we control cheatgrass? Well, a particularly important way of controlling cheatgrass is to restore native grasses. Here on the right, you see an image of native grasses. Um, once native grasses are established, the ecosystem is much more resilient and resistant against a cheatgrass invasion. Cheatgrass tends to invade when the ecosystem is disturbed, uh, perhaps through uh, construction, uh, roadsides, uh, places where heavy equipment is uh, moved across the land. Those are the places where cheatgrass can readily invade an ecosystem. So by restoring native grasses, we can uh, help slow down cheatgrass invasion. Another approach is to spray herbicide. This is an image of a, a modified C-130 aircraft. It is spraying the herbicide plateau onto a cheatgrass monoculture. Uh, in this campaign, 3,500 acres of cheatgrass are being treated 
This is occurring on a Mountain Home Air Force Base in Idaho. And this happens to be one of the sites where we are also looking at bacterial population on cheatgrass roots. There are, of course, some downsides uh, in using herbicide to treat cheatgrass invasion. Uh, herbicide is expensive. Uh, herbicide is also toxic, toxic to humans and toxic to wildlife. Uh, and finally, uh, it is hard to imagine that we could possibly treat the very large acreage of cheatgrass monocultures present in the Western United States with, with herbicides. And so this is a, a very limited uh, approach to resisting a cheatgrass invasion. It is also possible to control cheatgrass through targeted grazing. Uh, when cheatgrass is still in its early phase, in its seedling phase, when it's still green, it can provide high quality forage to cattle. Um, but this phase uh, of cheatgrass being green only lasts a relatively short period of time. And so it is important that a rancher then targets areas where there are cheatgrass monocultures at this time. Uh, but effective target grazing, grazing can limit the number of cheatgrass invasions that would occur. There also has been a lot of research in trying to find pathogens that could control cheatgrass invasions. Several bacteria have been isolated that control Bromus tectorum or cheatgrass in the lab. They prevent cheatgrass from germinating uh, and they can also kill uh, cheatgrass seedlings. However, uh, these bacteria, which would be a form of biocontrol, have also been tested in the field, and there the results are not as impressive. So here's an example of an article uh, published in Rangeland Ecology and Management uh, that, that argues that wheat suppressive bacteria fail to control cheatgrass under field conditions. The, uh, what, an important question is, why is cheatgrass so invasive? What is it about cheatgrass that makes it so successful that it can establish monocultures in the sagebrush ecosystem? Um, and there are a variety of different hypotheses. Um, for instance, the enemy release hypothesis, which argues that cheatgrass in its non-native range so in the United States, does not have many natural enemies. Uh, here you see an image on the right of a grasshopper feeding on sagebrush. Uh, grasshoppers much prefer sagebrush over cheatgrass for feeding. They much prefer native grasses over cheatgrass as well. And so the grasshoppers will limit the growth, growth of the native plants, uh, but they they do not touch the cheatgrass, and as a result, cheatgrass thrives and can take over habitat. So that's one, one hypothesis. Another important part of cheatgrass's success lies with microorganisms. We know that fungi and bacteria can help plants to grow. On the right here, there is an image of a plant root, and inside the plant root, you can see some dark structures which are part of mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae are fungi, uh, which have structures inside plant cells, uh, but also have mycelia that um, spread throughout the soil. And these mycorrhizae help plants to grow by securing nutrients or perhaps water for the plants. We also know that there are many bacteria that help plants grow. On this slide, you see fluorescent microscope images of bacteria that are inside plant cells. So there is a cotyledon, a small leaf, with different populations of bacteria shown here on the left. In green is one type of bacteria, and in red, you see another type of bacteria inside the plant cells of this leaf. And these bacteria help the plants to grow. On the right, are grass roots that are shown, and all of these different spots are different bacteria that are living inside the root cells of the plant. Again, there are different populations present. The red dots are different population of bacteria than the yellow dots. 
we have been studying if there are specific bacterial populations that grow on cheatgrass roots, but not on sage roots. Uh, and if that is the case, then we think these bacteria should be studied in greater detail because these bacteria might be helping cheatgrass to invade the sagebrush ecosystem. And if we know how cheatgrass is invading the sagebrush ecosystem, maybe we can come up with treatments to stop the cheatgrass invasion. The way we characterize bacterial communities in environmental samples, such as cheatgrass roots, is that we extract the DNA from the environmental sample, and then we sequence a small fraction of the bacterial cyclinous ribosomal RNA gene. On the upper left here is a Illumina MySeq DNA sequencing machine. Uh, we have such a, such a machine at Northern Arizona University, and this machine will sequence millions of different DNA molecules at the same time. On the bottom left here is a slide, and you can see all of these different colors spots on the slide. The color represents the nucleotide that is present in that DNA molecule on that spot of the slide. Um, so a blue color is a different DNA nucleotide than a red color, and then a green color or the yellow color. So these are four different nucleotides that make up the DNA. By going through 300 or 500 different cycles, at each time the spot on the slide will have a different color corresponding to what nucleotide is present in the DNA molecule. It is possible to get a 300 to 500 base pair sequence of the DNA molecule. And so here in the middle, you see a whole bunch of DNA sequences uh, that are obtained uh, by looking at this pattern from the Illumina sequencing slide. And once we have these many DNA sequences, we can then, um, through bioinformatics, determine what kind of bacteria are present in the different soil samples. So here is a, is a bar graph shown on the right. Uh, you can see a root sample. Uh, and each color is a, a different group of bacteria. In this situation, we are looking at phyla of bacteria, which is a very coarse taxonomic level of bacteria characterization. Uh, there are thousands of different bacterial species in a gram of soil, uh, and these bacterial species then can be grouped into different phyla, and each color in this bar shows a different phylum of bacteria. Uh, in this example, the root sample is compared to the soil sample, and you can see that there are some differences. For instance, the proteobacteria in purple uh, tend to be more prevalent in roots than in soil. We studied the bacterial communities on cheatgrass roots and sagebrush roots at three different locations in the western United States. Uh, one location was up in Idaho, that was the Mountain Home Air Force Base. Another location was in Utah, the Hill Air Force Base. And finally, a third location in Arizona, north of the Grand Canyon. All three of these sites suffered from cheatgrass invasions. We extracted the DNA from roots obtained at these different sites, as well as soil. Um, sequenced the sixinus ribosomal RNA gene of bacteria in these different samples. Uh, and then through ordination analysis, we asked the question, are these bacterial communities in roots and soil similar to each other, or are they very different? So this is an ordination plot, and the way to interpret an ordination plot is to look at clusters of samples. In this ordination plot, the roots are all circle, so both cheatgrass roots and sagebrush roots are represented by circles. The soil sample, in which there are no plant roots, are represented by triangles. All the blue samples have been derived from sagebrush roots or from bulk soil close to sagebrush plants. The red samples have been obtained from cheatgrass roots or from bulk soil close to cheatgrass plants. Now, if you look carefully at this ordination plot, you can see that all the triangles are clustered together over here. So these are all the soil samples and all the root samples are clustered together over here. There's clear separation between root samples and soil samples. 
So the biggest difference in bacterial community composition that we observe is between plant roots and bulk soil samples. If we only look at the root samples, we see that there is some clustering that happens as well. So here again is an ordination plot. All the sagebrush root samples are in blue and all the cheatgrass root samples are shown in red. Arizona is represented by closed circles. So here is, for instance, a closed a solid blue circle. That is a sagebrush root sample from Arizona. The open circles are samples from Idaho. And the stars or the asterisks are samples from Utah. If you look carefully, you can see that the cheatgrass root samples in Arizona and Idaho clearly separate from the sagebrush root samples in Arizona and Idaho. But the Utah samples don't separate as clearly. So the red stars are somewhat intermingled with the blue stars. So we see clear differences in the cheatgrass bacterial root community in Arizona and Idaho, but we do not, we do not see clear differences in the cheatgrass root community in the Utah site. If we go into more detail and we look at specific types of bacteria in our DNA sequence data set, uh, we see that there is a, a mycelious species. This is a proteobacteria, a specific type of bacteria. And this bacteria seems to be more abundant on cheatgrass roots than on sagebrush roots. So here is Arizona. R represents root sample. S is a bulk soil sample. Cheatgrass is shown in red, and sagebrush is shown in blue. Now you can see that the cheatgrass root sample seems to have uh, a more mycelia species than the sagebrush root sample. And the mycelia are not, well, are not well represented or not abundant in bulk soil samples in Arizona. Similarly in Idaho, the mycelia species are very abundant in cheatgrass root samples, but less so in sagebrush root samples. And again, they are not that abundant in bulk soil samples. In Utah, on the other hand, the mycelia species are present in both cheatgrass root samples as well as sagebrush root samples. Again, they're not very abundant in soil samples. Now recall that the bacterial communities in Arizona and in Idaho on cheatgrass roots were very different from the bacterial communities on sagebrush roots. But in Utah, the bacterial communities on cheatgrass roots were not that different from sagebrush roots. And so it makes sense that mycelia also is not that different in Utah, but it is more different in Arizona and Idaho. We are not the first people to identify mycelia species. They have been cultured from environmental samples around the world. We have not yet cultured a mycelia species from our cheatgrass roots. Um, but the other people who have gotten cultures of mycelia bacteria have taken electron microscope images of them. And here are some examples. You can see that the mycelia bacteria are rod shaped. So they're kind of elongated. Um, they do have flagella. So here's a single flagellum that's coming out of this mycelia species. Flagella are used for the bacteria to move in solution. So they can swim in soil water very rapidly. Um, some mycelia species, as, as this one, for instance, have these protuberances that come out of the bacteria, and it is unclear exactly why they have those. Now, some bacteria that are capable of degrading cellulose, an important plant component, uh, have cell, cellulose degradation machinery in these protuberances, um, but we do not know why mycelia has these protuberances. Interestingly, when other people isolate mycelia, they also find them on plant roots. Um, here are fluorescent microscope images which show mycelia bacteria on cucumber roots. So these green dots are all mycelia bacteria which are growing on cucumber roots. These red um, ovals in the background, these are the cucumber plant cells. So these are root cells. And then you can see that in between the root cells, there are lots of mycelia bacteria. Now here's another example. So this would be a root cell 
or another root cell right here, and then all these bacteria which are attached to the root cells. Um, so it is interesting that we find mycelia species as being abundant on cheatgrass roots, and other people are also finding mycelia bacteria on plant roots around the world. And there is tremendous interest at the moment in trying to figure out if we can understand what these mycelia bacteria are doing, and if we can um, then uh, exploit them to improve agricultural yield or to prevent uh, plant invasions, as examples. People have isolated mycelia from plant roots in different parts of the world, and they have shown that these mycelia bacteria can produce plant hormones such as indol acetic acids. These plant hormones help plants to grow bigger. Uh, mycelia cultures can also produce siderophores, which help plants access nutrition, again, helping plants to grow. And finally, and, and perhaps most interestingly from a cheatgrass perspective, Mycelia cultures can make antibacterial and antifungal compounds. Um, recall that biocontrol efforts in the field so far have failed. Uh, in these biocontrol efforts, bacteria were released who, that uh, could, could hurt or damage cheatgrass in the lab, but in the field, they didn't do very much. Uh, one hypothesis is that these mycelia cultures are present on cheatgrass roots. They make antibacterial compounds and they kill the bacteria that are released for biocontrol. Uh, and as a result, cheatgrass, cheatgrass survives and thrives without a problem. I would like to thank Paul Dykstra and Kitty Gehring, Michi Heyer, Chris Kaiser, Jacob Cohen, and Melissa Carrillo Galavis. Uh, they were all part of the team which studied the bacterial communities on cheatgrass roots. And finally, I would also like to thank the Department of Defense CERTA program. They provided funding to conduct this study.